Welcome to the very first episode of the Embodiment Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Walsh. So this is a podcast for anyone who believes the body is more than a brain taxi for martial arts teachers, yoga teachers, for embodiment coaches, for dance teachers, for people of all the movement disciplines. How it all comes together is what we look at. So the lived experience of the body. So the very first episode, I have to admit I'm a little bit nervous, even though I've done lots of YouTube recording before, this is my first podcast, I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, Our topic today is what is embodiment? So what you're going to learn on this fairly epic podcast I've got planned, what exactly is embodiment? So some real practical uh, down-to-earth definitions, some academic definitions, also where that comes from. So the history of embodiment, the different forces at play in um, how embodiment came to be uh, in the modern world and the different embodiment practices that are out there. We'll do some little practical experiments. I like to keep this a bit uh, interactive as well. We'll look at, you know, the right through to the modern world and the top people in the world today. That's our topic. What is embodiment? Where to begin? Well, it's a bit of a fashionable word, embodiment. Um, I've been involved in this field for myself for about 20 years. I'll probably talk a little bit about my um personal history at some point as well, just to introduce your host. It's become fashionable lately to talk about, you know, I was at a yoga conference, it was embodied this and embodied that. And I was like, okay, great. Let's, let's make sure that, you know, this, so the, the people actually know what this is and everyone has their own definition, of course. So, you know, this is my definition. I've thought about this a fair bit and, you know, you know talked with the various people in the community from various different angles on this. The simplest definition I've come up with of embodiment is how we are, how we are, so our manner of being. Uh, It relates to the subjective experience of the body, so not so much uh, the body as an object, but the body as part of our being. And, you know, you can experience that now. So as you're, you know, maybe you're standing, maybe you're walking, maybe you're commuting or in the car, feel your body. Obviously, if you're driving, don't close your eyes. Be aware as a body. The idea here is not just body awareness, but the body's part of who we are. Sometimes someone will say to me, like, is this yoga or is this martial arts? Is this bodied or is it embodied? And I'll say, okay, well, is there body awareness? That that's one. Yeah. And more than that, is is it working on ourselves as part of who we are as people? So the idea is the how, but also the who, how our identity is embodied. Um, you know, when we look at a body, we see history, we see the solidification of patterns of being. We see uh, in muscular tension patterns, posture patterns, movement patterns, a hi- the history of a person. So that's the kind of then of embodiment. The now of embodiment, of course, is it's the only place we can be now, actually. So mindfulness is an embodied practice, uh, at least it should be. So the idea of mindfulness, like say we're paying attention to our breath, uh, posture, whatever it is, that's in the now, the anchor in the now. And of course, you know, the future. So there's a way in which when we see a body or we're in our own body, there's the set of future possibilities, the future potential of the body. So embodiment can be seen as having layers, if you will. So there's a sort of situational layer, like, you know, notice this, like, how are you today? And that's the bit that you can actually notice. So right now, listening to this, you might notice your energy levels, your mood, your emotions, you know, if you're if you're in pain, that's something we can notice, how we are today. But then we also have our disposition. You know, this is... um. <clears throat> harder to notice because it becomes invisible as many methods to bring it out but the way in which we're um uh, our personality is predisposed towards certain actions relationships emotions ways of being we have a cultural embodiment again that can be pretty invisible um, i always notice when i go abroad and all of a sudden i feel feel english you know there in the back of there, there it's like oh um there's also environmental embodiment like you know i'm in a certain shaped room i'm in my office in Brighton I I can see out the window it's a fairly blue sky today I just heard some seagulls there's a very um part of my auditory environment I don't know if they pick the mic pick those up was the seagulls and that that creates a certain mood a certain way of being for me uh you know you might have a different association with seagulls like it's a sort of holiday thing perhaps for for a lot of people um so we have the you know the personal layer the cultural layer the environmental layer and then just purely the biological layer so let's take the fight flight response you know, I've studied that in around 30 countries around the world, working with business people and, you know, in war zones, all kinds of things. And that same flight freeze flop response technically exists around the world in all people. It also exists in dogs, you know, it's mammalian. So that's a layer which isn't cultural. It's just part of our biological heritage, if you will. It's not so much personal that we could build, you know, personal patterns on top of that, as it were. 
Okay, so um, we have these layers. Uh, in terms of mindfulness, we could say embodiment's a bit more than mindfulness in that it's, as well as awareness, there's choice. So I often joke that all I teach is awareness and choice. And, you know, the choice part is critical here. So, you know, right now, if you're standing, be aware how you're standing, and then you could choose to stand slightly differently. If you're walking, you could choose to walk differently. Yeah, uh, if you're doing yoga while listening to this, you could choose to do yoga differently. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the activity is, horseback riding, whatever. Um, we have awareness, but then we have choice to influence our way of being. Um, what does embodiment influence? Well, you know, this is the key thing. Like, why do I have a job? Because these aren't obvious. Perception. Yeah, our embodiment changes how we see the world. If you're on holiday, you're in a good mood, your embodiment's different. The world literally looks different, literally looks different. There's lots of experiments on this now, actually. Cognition, again, lots of experiments on this. You could make people, there's someone called the dance doctor, Dr. Peter Lover. I think it's a Hertfordshire University who gets people to dance in different ways. And if you get them to dance in a sort of square, organized way, they get better at maths. And if you get them to dance in a sort of crazy all over the place way, they get better at creative thinking. So our embodiment is actually changing our thinking. We think just the brain is thinking, but well, the whole body is the brain. That would be almost another definition, actually. So what else? Cognition, uh, perception, emotion, of course. The, you know, emotions are bodily actions. One of my teachers, Paul Linden, defines them that way. Um, certainly, you know, you, you get this when you're angry. It feels a certain way in the body. Our relationships. Look at how you are now in your body. I mean, what kind of relationships does that predispose? You know, are you very open? Are you very closed? Are you um, very analytical, very uh, judgmental? You know, what types of relationship are predisposed in the body and we know this right we know that there's certain people you take one look at them and go okay this looks like an aggressive person I, I might this might be a lot of conflict with this person another person you think wow um you know instinctively it can be quite um a deep choice like wow there's something about this person i want to get to know them maybe i'm going to ask them out on a date or uh, give them a job so that sense that different types of relationship are possible through the body what else intuition uh you know there's a sort of personal intuition or access in the unconscious potentially some kind of inter interpersonal intuition sort of deeper sense of that culture we've talked about before so all these different things are being mediated through the body culture you can think of as a group body so how we think how we see uh, how we relate how we feel the actions and things we can do basically every significant thing in life is embodied that's every significant thing in life pretty useful area to look at um, in terms of practical applications for embodiment you know i'm working in the business world working with stress management leadership communication uh, with ngos i've worked with activists health obviously is one area but it goes way beyond health so this podcast i'm not going to be so much looking at um pain relief or you know how to be optimally healthy i'll leave that to other people because it involves all these other areas beyond health you know the, the general view of the body you know, if you think of like what most people view the body is, is as this brain taxi, as my colleague Francis Bryars says, a lump of meat, uh, sarks rather than soma, to use the Greek term. Sarks meant hunk of meat, soma meant the body in its lived psychological, emotional and social political wholeness. That's another definition for you there, slightly more wordy than how we are. That the body is involved with everything we do so it has you know practical applications across the board really um it sort of doesn't matter you know let's take centering this this practice i'll do another podcast on that but centering is is a way of managing our state reducing this fight flight freeze response um and that's just going to be useful for anything you do that involves any kind of pressure or stress right and we, we all have that in our lives so um the applications are, are pretty huge here uh, i'm guessing you know that if you're if you're tuning into this all right so what other definitions do we have well how are you different from a chair? Yeah, look in your environment, see if you can find a chair or a, a lamppost, you know, some kind of object, and just reflect for a moment. How are you different from that? So the two things that really come up for me are movement and awareness, yeah, and ethics also built in there. You know, if I move a chair, it doesn't move unless I move it, right? There's, it doesn't have that sort of will to move, uh, will to action that's there. Um, and it's also not aware. I mean, maybe on some very abstract philosophical level, we could argue that, but... Uh, you know, pretty hard to in many ways without getting pretty wanky. So, um, and ethically as well, you know, if I just pick up a human being and try to move them, they're either going to complain or you're going to say, well, that's not really cool. What are you doing? You know, this human being has rights. You can't just move them. You know, a chair, if we broke a chair, you might feel slightly sad, but you only feel sad because someone's workmanship had got into that, right? Some person had made that. Um, so ethics opens up with this and embodiment and ethics are intertwined. This is one of the reasons I think embodiment is so important in that if we can't feel ourselves, we can't feel others, we can't feel the planet. 
objectification, the opposite, if we will, of embodiment, is essentially being psychopathic. So if we are feeling ourselves, our empathy is online. That's an embodied capacity, whether it's empathizing. You know, if we see a forest being destroyed and go, oh, that doesn't feel good. If we see a child being hurt, if we walk past, say, the an, uh, inequality, we walk past the homeless person in the street in, in Brighton or wherever we live, and um, that feels bad in our body. So being numb to our body has this huge ethical implication. And also for ourselves, right? Like, I work with a lot of people. I'm doing a workshop on self-care at the weekend and next weekend. And it's a lot of people just brutalizing themselves because they're not feeling themselves. Because they're not feeling themselves, they're able to treat themselves as an object, as a thing. Now, you can actually try that. I wouldn't recommend doing this for too long, but take your arm and relate, no, not relate to it, pick it up as an object like you would an ashtray. Notice how the arm is a thing. You know, it might be a useful thing, but as a thing, this is generally how a doctor might look at your arm, for example, as an object and notice how that is. Often people will find it not particularly pleasant to um, treat themselves in that way. So what else do we have? Another way is to see your arm as part of who you are, to feel as you touch your arm, to be aware that you're touching part of yourself, to move to realize that that arm has held people you love. Maybe it has fought battles. Maybe it has written great works. Maybe it's uh, just all the things involved in your life. You know? These are quite different. And if you, if you have a friend, you can try this with a friend as well to objectify their arm. Um, and this, you know, we talk about sexual objectification, but this is the, the even more uh, fundamental than that. It's the objectification of disembodiment. That's what allows violence, sexual objectification, etc. Um, and then, you know, how is it to relate to that person through the arm? And I said, I wouldn't do the first one for too long, either on yourself or others, and with some permission there. And again, even it's not really a fair exercise, because as soon as you had permission, you're not objectifying, right? But that's just the ethics, the exercise. Yeah, so not too healthy, not too enjoyable. I've done this exercise with hundreds of people around the world, and people normally say, wow, that wasn't particularly enjoyable. I didn't particularly like being objectified, and I felt like I could be in relationship that's another way of looking at it actually is the body is about embodiment is about relationship relationship with yourself others and the wider world the big body of the planet body is a verb my colleague alexander is fond of saying i think i said that originally but i don't know maybe i didn't maybe someone else said that but this is quite a different reality the body is a verb rather than a noun as a process an ongoing process and that means we can be in relationship with ourselves and, and others if we are embodied quite a lot in there maybe time to take a breath if we're out on the embodiment podcast my aim for this podcast is to um make exercises to make it interactive to make the experience of listening to this embodied experience so i'd always encourage you on this podcast to notice how you're instinctively responding is it enthusiasm is it sort of agreement is that kind of nodding of the body Perhaps it's resistance, perhaps it's nothing, you know, sort of numbing you out. Maybe you listen to another podcast, if that's the case. Uh, There's something here that's exciting you, that's bringing you alive, yeah? So keep. I'm going to keep reminding uh, listeners and myself as I record, I've got a bit of a stomach pain today that's uh, affecting me and my voice is slightly different from normal as well, to make listening to these podcasts an embodied experience, yeah? So when we say embodied, of course, that means not just body it's not, uh, you know, the body beautiful. So uh, one of my teachers, which is Josie Heckler, always talks about the body as, as, as aesthetic and athletic. And so you distinguish embodiment from that. So for most people, the body's a brain taxi. And the reason, you know, if I talk about embodiment, that middle-aged sort of, uh, you know, intelligent, well-educated business people sort of titter like schoolboys sometimes. Uh, it's to them, the body is just an object of maybe of sex or going to the toilet. It's reduced to sort of not very much, which is why people get embarrassed. Obviously, there's a lot of insecurity also around body image. So I notice people around the world, but particularly women, are increasingly young men. And when I say body, they sort of go, oh, God, people are going to think I'm fat or maybe I'm too short or too whatever. So it's important when we're talking about embodiment to say, look, you can be deeply grounded and still be in a wheelchair. I taught someone in a wheelchair not long ago, actually. You can be, take up a lot of space and still be a short person. Um, I'm quite I'm short, relatively short, so I'm 5'8", about 1'7", 3". Uh, it's a little on the short side for the UK. And my friends, when they haven't seen me for a while, they always say, oh, well, I've forgotten you were short. I've forgotten about that. And, uh, and the, the reason is I kind of, you know, originally I used to get insulted. Then I realized actually it was a bit of a compliment because I was showing up as big. I'm relatively um, confident, dare I say, a little charismatic. And when I 
And with people, they experience me as big. That's the subjective experience of my embodiment as taking up space. So, it's not, so we're not interested in um, the physical side. That's, by the way, something I teach and I teach executives about presence, for example, or people that are doing um, talks or you know, need to publicly perform in some way. So we're not talking about just the body in terms of um, you know, the athletic or if you're skinny or tall or anything like that. And that's not so much the interest of embodiment. There is an embodied approach to beauty, which goes much deeper, which I'll again talk about in another episode, tease you with another one. Uh, however we're, we're moving beyond that um, ultimately for me embodiment is just about being human yeah it's just about being human that would be a, another definition I could give let me give you the formal definition so I run a course called the Embodied Facilitator Course which I'm going to plug shamelessly on various podcasts uh, and this is from the sort of day one handout that we give people um, the definition of embodiment is a more formal definition now this has taken me some years to craft this so embodiment is the way we are it's how we feel, relate, and do. The purpose of our bodies, specifically our posture, movement, tension, and bodily awareness patterns, not just functional in terms of transporting the head around, but is a partial solidification of a set of habits we call ourselves. The way we hold the body, move around, and intend and intend with the body is a way of managing and expressing who we are. The unconscious self and potentially the consciously created self, that's the art of embodiment, is visceral. Our shaping is as much a solidification of past conditions and a way of shaping the future based on these as an appropriate response to the present. So that's the idea that we don't just, when we stand or sit, we don't just stand or sit in a purely functional way. That would be, I um, mean, you know, it's very unusual to see someone sit or stand purely functionally. They're often off to one side and it's because all these other layers and things are present. Our physical form, back to the definition, our physical form is our perceptual, cognitive, emotional, inspirational, relational and behavioural context. That's the word, it's key, it's our context. It is how we see, think, feel, create, relate and act. Um, how we move is how we are. How we move is how we are, Stuart Heller, I believe. Um, we literally lean towards one life or another. Embodiment is not just inhabitation, being aware of the body as a thing, implying a separate something uh, that the, the body is aware of as it, like we say, my body, like it's a separate object, like my car, but being aware as a body. The body the body is I, that's a, a nice definition. The body of I, uh, potentially we as well, the social body. Becoming conscious of our usually unconscious personal shaping, developing a range of options, so range, awareness range and choice, in this regard, and having the freedom of choice as a result of what embodiment means. More poetically, when awareness and embodiment intertwine, the body turns from prison to a question, a question of spirit, of love and meaning. More consciously, and in the fullest sense, embodiment is the subjective aspect of the body. This has been somewhat verbose, uh, but how we feel, relate and do, or just the way we are, are good definitions of embodiment as any so there's quite a lot in there to chew on some more poetic stuff uh, we can certainly you know get poetic around this subject and that often gets us closer to the truth truth i would say um, let me pull out some key pieces for this managing expressing who we are so that's sort of two key embodiment skills as it were a conscious self but also consciously creating the self so that's the definition here is between conscious and unconscious embodiment and this creates a lot of confusion just because the way the words use you know he embodies this he embodies that colloquially we, we're all unconsciously embodied. Yeah, so even if you've done no embodied practice, you're unconsciously embodied in that you have a history and that history is laid down. So you look at anyone in the street, you see a different way of being, you instinctively get a sense of that. A dog or a child gets a sense of that, actually, and that's their unconscious embodiment. Conscious embodiment is if we're actually choosing through in the short-term state management or in the long-term through practice, there are two things we'll talk a lot about on this podcast, that you're creating a way of being, um, through the body consciously in the short term or the long term so that's conscious embodiment and I think that's well worth making a distinction because often a lot of the conversations get um, confused between that Wendy Palmer's system and another embodiment teacher I respect used to be called conscious embodiment I think it's called leadership embodiment now so that is an important distinction between conscious and unconscious embodiment you also notice the different tools we can work with there so um these are the tools of the trade, you know, whether it's awareness, it's the sort of only mandatory one by definition. But then we have, you know, intention, intention, movement, uh, you know, breathing. There's all these other different tools we can work with. And visualization, you'll, you'll notice that some systems will be better at those than others. So you might want to just take a moment, you know, I'm imagining you have some skills if you're listening to this, some interest. So, you know, are you trained in visualization techniques? Are you mostly a posture person? Are you mostly a movement person? Are you mostly working with breath? Are you mostly working with intention? There's all these different ways you can be working. Uh, and nobody I know is, you know, maximally skilled in all of them. So we tend to be slightly um, biased in that. 
noticing I'm relaxing into this now, kind of enjoying this. This is something I've done as a sort of talk on various my, uh, courses of mine kind of a number of times, but it's nice just to be um, doing it out there to you guys. I hope this is serving you. And with these podcasts, we're going to make a Facebook group. So it's always nice to hear um, you know, your feedback on this, not just feedback, but your views and you know what is embodiment to you. I saw an article put uh, together by some Finnish people and they uh, um, had like 20 yoga teachers uh, talk about what embodiment is. All right, so let's talk about, you know, why do I have a job? Why is this a thing? Why is this a subject? How is this a buzzword? Where does this come from? Well, to talk about embodiment, we have to, of course, talk about disembodiment. So what is the history of disembodiment? Now, I think it's easy to sort of um, hark back romantically to some sort of tribal period and say, oh, everyone was fully embodied. Well, you know, where were they? Uh, Certainly life was more uncomfortable. And for our ancestors, you know, it wasn't the easy, we didn't have central heating and the the elements are on your face. You've got the rain and the sun and the wind on your face on a daily basis. We're not so sedentary, almost certainly. So I think people had much greater chance of being embodied, at least in that way, though it perhaps wasn't a conscious practice. Some people say the original split from nature, the original split that's in our own nature of disembodiment was agriculture yeah so this is uh, really hard to determine but this was um the birth of the sort of cities the birth of agriculture mesopotamia some thousands of years ago some people had patriarchy in there too there's a sort of feminist uh, view of, of embodiment history as well you know so this is kind of looking at ancient times coming into um you know we might say the greeks had a philosophical base for this body and mind as different things the body mind split right up to kind of western philosophy much maligned descartes um there were others but the greeks up to him you know certainly had this philosophy of body and mind and also look at religion you know so mainstream christianity and islam to a lesser extent judaism i would argue uh, would regard the body as not the soul so the soul is something special and good and better than the body. Uh, this idea that uh, the, so the body, in fact, was sinful, it was bad, it was something you know, that might get involved with sex and all sorts of things. Moving away from the sort of pagan body celebrating traditions of, you know, fucking in the fields to uh, uh, make some fertility. Oh, by the way, they will be swearing on this podcast. That's my first fuck, wasn't it? That wasn't bad for someone from an Irish background. That's one of we are, what, 25 minutes in almost? Blimey, that was pretty good. Anyway, back to the subject. So um, the idea of the religion is saying the body is sinful. You'll see this in mainstream religion, you know, in sort of a fundamentalist Christianity in America or Islam around the world, the body is something bad and sinful to be uh, to be repressed, and that you know that continues to the modern world. Industrialization. This was the idea that we were simply cogs in a machine. We are things which are just parts of a machine. We should be productive. This was the kind of industrialized view of the body. Yeah, that I, I, you know. It's certainly, I think, it's one of the big ones. Uh, it's a mindset shift. It's a philosophical shift. The body as a machine is, you know, fully integrated into Western medicine, which has many, many benefits, but um, it is disembodying. I remember when I broke my shoulder snowboarding, about, I know, about probably about 15 medical professionals touched my shoulder and my, my body over the sort of couple of days after that. You know, I was lucky to get some good treatment. But after a while, I got so pissed off with them touching me as object, you know, it, and it was just implicit in their whole model, the whole worldview. I was like, no, I'm not a thing. Um, we can look at consumerism as well. This also objectifies the body. You know, I'm walking down the street the other day in Brighton, there's these huge billboards of bodies and the idea of a body to be uh, traded, you know, we'll see this in sort of modern culture around uh, putting yourself on Instagram, the selfies, da, da, da. I don't want to demonize social media because I use it a lot myself and it's good in it, but there's certainly a way in which people are kind of looking at their bodies as objects to be manipulated and and, and uh, manipulated and sold you know my wife was telling me how to take a selfie and I should take it from up here not down there everyone's a kind of model everyone's doing their own PR you know there's a consumerism of the body you should be look a certain way the pressure that was traditionally particularly put on women though now I think is also on men uh, the body image issues the airbrushed bodies the impossible to achieve bodies uh, you know embodiment is political there's, there's no getting away with it as soon as we look at embodiment we look at empathy we look at uh, we challenge some of these narratives around industrialization or religion or consumerism absolutely there's no getting away from the fact the body the body politic you know the body is political that's just how it is other forces of disability the information age 
I'm going to spend a lot of my day today, I'm not teaching today, so I'm going to spend a lot of my day sat at a computer doing emails. And it's very easy in that sedentary life, in that, you know, be, be drawn to the fast moving cognitive information, you know, to get my phone out continuously on every little rest I have and, 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 uh, and, uh, you know, be caught in that and caught in the mind. I, sometimes I finish the end of the day and I'm, God, I wasn't aware of my body the whole day. Or, you know, one thing I like to do is drink lots of water. I'm drinking now, actually. And that, you know, it means I have to get up and go to the toilet fairly regularly, which reminds me I have a body because, you know, I'm pretty disembodied. Sometimes I'm working a computer, but um, I've yet to actually wet myself, yeah? So it reminds me I have a body. It gives me those little movement breaks. I try to do those regularly. Um, so the information age is increasingly abstract. You know, you can imagine at some point we'll just be uh, plugged into virtual reality with food being delivered to us. And, uh, you, know, const- you know, you see some kids with computer games now are really in this state, you know, 18, 16 hours a day. There's a name for this addiction of computer games in, in, in Southeast Asia. It's particularly prevalent um, also around the world. So the information age is potentially disembodying, but I don't want a bad mouth information age because it's also why you're listening to this. It's also the fact that we have access to all these different types of embodiment. Uh, we can at least, you know, even if you're living, I've got some students of mine who live in Ethiopia. I taught an Aikido school in Ethiopia years ago. I started the first Aikido dojo in Ethiopia with my friend Tessify. And, um, and Meshu as well, actually, I should mention Meshu. Meshu. Hi, Meshu. So, um, if these kids are there in Ethiopia, but they've just about got online now. It's not a particularly fast connection where they are in rural Ethiopia, but they can actually look at all the different styles of Aikido, all the different things they haven't got access to and, and start learning about them. And they're really hungry for that, which is great. At least we can connect on social media, which please do. You know, let's reach out. Let's find community around this. We can have these communities around embodiment that, um, you know, I live in Brighton, which is a very alternative, slightly kind of hippie, bolder, San Francisco type town, Byron Bay type vibe. Um, and we have some community here around embodiment, but a lot of people don't. So the internet's fantastic for that. So what I see in the modern world is on the one hand, these forces of disembodiment are as strong as they've ever been. They're massive, you know. But on the other hand, I could be very ho- hopeful when I see that, that we now have this great possibility. And we'll come more into this later. So one more force of disembodiment that's operated throughout history, including certainly in the world today, trauma. So when people have overwhelming experiences, when the body becomes unbearable, people numb. Numbing is one of the main symptoms of things like PTSD. People cut off from their bodies. So trauma is a force of disembodiment around the world. I've worked in a lot of areas of conflict. I was teaching in Northern Ireland not that long ago this year. I've taught in Ukraine, Israel, Afghanistan, West Africa, East Africa, the slums of Brazil, pretty much everywhere where people shoot at each other. And what I see is trauma and numbing as a result, which can lead to more trauma. Vicious cycles will do a whole uh, episode on trauma, no doubt, at some point. So what do we have? So these are the forces of disembodiment in the world, which leads us to the area of embodiment. Like, how did this happen as a thing? You know, and this also starts to map out what are the influences on this field. Before we go into that, though, maybe take a moment to reflect on how these forces of disembodiment have affected you. You know, did you grow up in a very religious family, for example, that told you it's sinful, sex and dance and things are sinful? Um, you know, do you live in a big city where it's very industrialised? Are you on, online a lot? So in terms of day to day and your personal history, how have these uh, disembodiment factors affected you? So the history of embodiment, we can talk about the ancient history. So a lot of practices are shamanic. You know, if I'm teaching four elements model, for example, in a corporate environment or to a bunch of life coaches I'm training, which is pretty typical model I use. I mean, that's ancient, you know, that's cross-cultural ancient model. So we've always had people responsible for that. If you look at most indigenous peoples, they have uh, initiation ceremonies. Some of these are deliberately disembodied, actually, involving a lot of trauma. Most of them, however, about getting in the body. There's dance practices, you know, there's practices, ritual practices. So we can talk about the uh, kind of ancient practices, if you will. Perhaps the sort of village shaman was in charge of those. Yeah, but certainly just built into life as well. I mean, even when I grew up, I grew up in rural Cambridge, so it's a rural, kind of very rural area. And there was all these sort of pagan traditions in maypoles and, you know, different old pagan traditions that have been kept and sort of Christianity was layered on top of. And a lot of them were quite bodily, like dancing around the maypole, which is a um, actual representation of a phallus. OK, so then what do we else we have? We had the sort of formal practices, things like yoga, martial arts. The history of these is often not quite as old as people say. I mean, well, yoga and in inverted commas has existed for thousands of years, like meditation in yoga. Uh, certainly, you know, modern postural yoga, as we see it, not so much. This was actually influenced by um, Danish and Swedish gymnastics and British military fitness. And some of these practices, you know, Tai Chi might only be a few hundred years old, not a few thousand. 
It's it's hard to say, but you know, there's certainly some roots of things like yoga and martial arts that in the East particularly that go back. There were some Christian mystical forms as well, but the, certainly the ones that we see in the modern world that have got most famous and most preserved are these practices of Eastern arts. Uh, and this is one of, of course, the major influences on embodiment. I myself am an Aikido black belt. I've done Aikido for 20 years. I've done uh, yoga for about 21 years. Um, these are sort of major influences on me and on the whole embodiment field, I would say. In the modern context, where this doesn't embodiment doesn't just come from the east, it also comes from the west. Yeah, so you had Freud, who was very much you know lie down on the couch, forget you have a body, very much about the head and about talking. Um, but he had a student called Reich. Reich ended up being a bit of a crazy wild card, uh, all going energy and things like that. But Reich was the founder of what could be called body psychotherapy. Yeah, so um, this had a whole tradition through people. Oh God, all sorts of neo Reichians, right up to sort of modern day Hakomi. Uh, Alexandra Lowen was a famous one. So the the Reichians and body therapy was was a major tradition. Um, there was also dance movement therapists. So they were some more dancers who were coming to therapy rather than body therapists. Were more like uh, therapists who were like, oh my God, we've got a body that matters. Uh, and and dance movement therapists were dancers who started to realize therapy existed. They were often influenced by Jung. And there was a whole bunch of people, particularly women, incidentally, um, starting in sort of 1920s Central Europe, Switzerland, Austria, Germany. And then they sort of fled as the Nazis kind of came to power to places like the UK and America. And that um, kick-started dance movement therapy across the world. So dance movement therapy and body therapy, they often have their conference together. You know, they're, they're fairly integrated, but you can think of it as coming from those two sides. And there's a slightly different route through Reich and through uh, Jung. I'm not massively educated on that field as I'm not a dance movement therapist or a body therapist. So maybe others can um, flesh that out a little bit. I'm sure I've missed some big names there. The other founders are sort of turn of the century onwards um, up to sort of World War II period, um, Alexander and Feldenkrais. So these are two giants in the field we could call somatic body work. So somatic, another synonym for embodied pretty much, uh, the conscious experience of the body. Um, so these were guys who weren't just doing like massage on your body. Um, Ida Rolf would be another one who's sort of proto-embodiment. But certainly with Alexander, you know, it's all about awareness. It was all about use. With Feldenkrais, he had these awareness through movements, lessons. I still, you know, I was studying Feldenkrais and Alexander literally yesterday. I'm recording this in the morning it's been not 24 hours since i studied some of this work they're still the giants of the field many of the people i respect and love today were actually trained by these guys alexander a little bit earlier he came from sort of he was an actor who lost his voice and he thought how do i how did i lose my voice he looked at how he used his body um, it can be not quite cultish, that would be unfair, but there's certainly a bit of a cult of Alexander now. Um, Feldenkrais, I think, is really underrated. And it's, if you're interested in free movement of the body, it can still be a bit mechanically orientated. They tend to be less interested in psychology in some ways. Um, but for Feldenkrais, absolutely genius work. You know, I'd certainly I found it far more effective than yoga in bringing um, freedom and movement to my body. And I think yoga is kind of rediscovering that now. Okay, so there were sort of some of the early greats, body work. There's many other body work traditions um, that are there. Uh, so the next period in time, we think sort of this 40s kind of time when these people spread out, the 60s. So um, the integration of the East and the West really happening in the West Coast of America, the birth of the hippie movement. Obviously, the hippies were very much into the body. You know, if you think of it as um, up to then, the body had been either like something sinful or a brain taxi. You know, the body had been saying, well, we have to keep it in health efficiently, but it's not really interesting. The hippie movement was deeply interested in emotion and feeling and intuition uh, and they were it, it, what was happening in places like Ezalan on the west coast of America um, people like George Leonard the human potential movement Michael Murphy Gabrielle Roth and her five rhythms dance was a real coming together uh, and this was a real epicenter for a lot of the work that I've made in my life uh, in the modern context obviously this ancient context older context so this was a big deal when these first things came together. There was body workers there, you know, there was a uh, dance movement therapist there, there was meditation teachers. We could include meditation in the sort of yoga tradition. Obviously, it's a lot of body-based meditation. Most mindfulness is, is bodily mindfulness. Not all we can be aware of thoughts, but, you know, we talk about breath. What is that? Well, it's body, yeah. So these things were colliding for the first time. And that collision continues, you know, in the modern world of people bringing psychotherapy to yoga and vice versa. That was the kind of 60s generation 
And I say that, I'd say they were a category. They were sort of very pluralistic. They just said, well, everything's all good. They weren't particularly using Western values that much of sort of science and questioning. And there was a kind of hippie flavor to it. So there's a kind of second wave of their students starting in the 90s. And this would be like myself or my colleague Anu called Francis Bryars, you know, I mean, any of the sort of people that are rising stars today um, were second generation. This a baby boomer generation are pretty much retiring or dying, unfortunately, now. Um, so there's a second generation. It's slightly different in that we had integration from the beginning. So it wasn't, you know, like some of my teachers might have studied Aikido and maybe one other thing. But, you know, for me, as I was starting Aikido at 18 years old, I'd already done yoga. You know, there was a dance class nearby. Uh, I'd already tried body work. You know, the internet was coming in. I was starting to research all these different things. So, you know, there was a very different world to grow up in and there was a reintegration of Western values. So it's a sense of bringing it to business, making it more mainstream. You know, yoga had really um, blown up in the 90s and it become rather than alternative, I'd say more integrated, we could think of. Um, it had less hippy dippy and more grounded, more sci- using more scientific rationalism and discerning between practices saying, well, this practice is good for this, this for that, not just being purely pluralistic. So this is the movement from, if you were studying spiral dynamics from green meme to integral, if that makes no sense, think of it as the move from everything's groovy to yes, however, some things are better for these contexts. Yeah. So a truly integrated practice, I didn't think really happened in the 60s. Sometimes I talk about the big six. So there's, there's many, you know, anything can be embodied. Walking can be embodied, surfing can be embodied. But in terms of what's influenced the field, uh, we see these big six of yoga and meditation, body therapy, theatre and improv. I haven't talked much about that, but that's theatre's had a rich embodied tradition, method acting, improvisational comedy, richly embodied. They have many of the same models independently uh, made as, as body psychotherapists and well worth investigating. My, my colleague Rachel Blackman and Francis Breyers are deep in that world and I've learned a lot from them. Then we have dance and we can think of partner dance as well as conscious dance. So um, partner dance would be things like uh, tango and salsa, which have you know, been made, making a comeback. They don't have to be embodied. You know, none of these things can be embodied. They could be just be body. Yeah. If they're not using awareness and relating to the self. Yeah. Most yoga, for example, isn't it's, it's body today. It's not embodied. I think that's a bit of a tragedy. So you have dance, conscious, and otherwise you have body work. Again, you can be working on the body. Uh, you can be working with the body or through the body. This is uh, Richard Stracy Heckler distinctions that I think are quite nice. On the body for me is body, not embodied. Uh, and martial arts. So these are pretty popular in the world today. And the collision of various martial arts, things like MMA is very interesting. We see this collision of things again. Um, so these are the kind of big six. Y- yoga, and bo- yoga and meditation, body therapy, theater and improv, dance, body work, martial arts. And it's worth reflecting if you're listening to this, sort of how many of these do you have experience of and expertise in? So I myself have got reasonable expertise in martial arts, getting there with yoga and pretty some experience of the other four. And that's mandatory for my students as they at least experience the other four. Um, unless you're living in the back of beyond, there's really no um, excuse for that these days. It's, it's all there if, if you if you want to you go for it. So we have these six fields and I think it's worth having some influence of, um, from all of them, being aware of all of them. The reason being that they uh, all have a different perspective. They will have a different bias. They will have different blind spots. Um, you know, martial artists can be very much about combat and not so much about pleasure, for example. Yeah, and they're both worth looking at. Um, I don't know. Yoga people have a particular perspective on how things are. Body therapists tend to see the unconscious, whereas other people might not see the unconscious. Dance, you know, partner dance tends to be about relationship. Conscious dance is about following the body. So they all have bias um, in terms of the culture around them, the perspective, things that are missing in terms of the skill sets. So it's well worth reflecting for a moment, like what's your perspective maybe you're i don't know anyone who's absolutely expert and by that i mean like ten thousand hours plus and all of them there's a few people like paul Linden and richard strategy heckler who are getting there on that who are not far off that but even then they've maybe got four or five of the six um i just don't think there's enough time in a lifetime what we tend to do on our, our courses is have a staff who kind of flesh it out you know there's others you could add there like the arts could be added in there again you know that would be a major one generally uh, ecotherapy, there's other ones we can add in there. And there's intricative arts, something like body mind therapy, which is, um, sorry, BMC uh, from Body Bainbridge Cohen, uh, body mind centering, excuse me. It's kind of intricate practices involving a number of these. 
Um, so uh, yeah, it's more complex than this little map I'm showing you saying, but hopefully this gives you a bit of a sense of where some of your biases might be. How does that influence your perspective on embodiment? Um, and I think if there's one thing I'm good at, it's seeing how they fit together. So I've had that feedback from various teachers that I'm an integrator, uh, kind of like Ken Wilbur is in, in the philosophy world, uh, someone who integrates different body practices and how they fit together. Um, so modern context, we could also talk about research. So Amy Cuddy's fantastic power poses since been debunked a little bit, but not fully. It was more like moderating what she was saying. Um, has kicks the one of the most popular TED Talks online. I highly recommend it if, if you haven't ever seen it. She kickstart the idea of embodiment research that perhaps wouldn't have the word embodiment. I was talking to um, someone from Goldsmiths University who's doing research on yoga. Obviously, the mindfulness people, John Cabot Zinn, etc., kick this off kind of. And now people like Helen Payne working with dance therapy research. Um, there's a great book. 59 seconds by professor richard wiseman it's interesting when you google sort of body books what comes up you know like tim ferris is the four hour body and it's again this very mechanized view of the body so that still exists if you look at gym culture it's your body as a machine uh so uh yeah you know that we're, we're really while i see that embodiment is making huge headway in the modern world and i i think we have the greatest chance of being embodied particularly through the practice of yoga this is why i work a lot with some called embodied yoga principles as a way of um uh, enriching yoga as, as the key body practice in the modern world i don't see that's going to happen with dance or aikido for example much so i i love those practices we're also up against it in, in 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 terms of how the body's viewed in terms of advertising and the like so um you know it's an interesting time we live in and uh, you know for me part of my motivation here is that realizing the body is so important to ethics environmental problems social justice problems some of the real challenges of the modern world trauma you know war there's so much around disembodiment that i think we desperately need embodiment and that is you know where we're at in the modern world maybe i'll say a little bit about my personal journey in this i mean i don't think i'm particularly uh, important here but it's uh, I guess you guys are going to be curious, like, who is this guy who's hosting? I'm going to be doing interviews on this podcast. I've got all kinds of fun people lining up and emailing people yesterday about this, or some of the big names I've already mentioned, um, you know, so my own journey. Um, before I do that, though, let me sort of say who are the top people in the world as I, as I see it today. So the big names in the field, God, where to begin? I'm sure I'm going to miss some people out and upset some people in this. Don Hanlon Johnson, he's kind of one of the daddies of kind of Californian uh, embodiment. He's uh, written a lot of really good books. Um, he certainly is a, one of the grandfathers of the field. I'm trying to get him on the show, actually. Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, I mentioned, she's an absolute genius. I would reserve that word for no more than five people I'm going to talk about. So she's amazing. Uh, not my particular flavor in some ways, but I want to acknowledge her. Body Mind Centering is a kind of a big one that's out there. Uh, in the dance world, there's Gabrielle Roth just died not that long ago unfortunately uh it's kind of fire rhythms there's other senior fire rhythms teachers now as one called adam barley uh, i particularly like her son jonathan haran as well anna halprim so she's a big one um i'm sure there's more dance people that uh uh, I'm kind of forgetting, but uh, Anna Halpern is definitely one of the big names. The, the perspective I'm coming from a lot is kind of Aikido influence. Well, Aikido, particularly in starting in the 60s, influenced embodiment, and it's translated particularly well into uh, business culture. So in terms of embodied coaching and that kind of thing, embodied leadership, a uh, term I believe coined by Richard Strozzi Heckler, one of my teachers, yeah, Richard Strozzi Heckler, definitely one of the big names in the field, really just solidly knows his stuff. He and I have had our personal differences over the years, but he's a great man and what he does is great work. So I'm not going to not gonna say anything bad about him. Uh, Paul Linden, probably my biggest mentor. Um, he's working from a sort of, uh, again, an absolute genius. He's working from an Aikido base mixed with various other things, Feldenkrais and Alexander and uh, karate and other uh, meditation. Paul Linden working a lot with trauma recovery and body peace building. So in some ways, similar to Strozzi, but it's a different emphasis, you know, working with kids with ADHD rather than, say, business people. Uh, Wendy Palmer. Um, Wendy Palmer, Richard Strozzi Heckler and George Leonard used to run a dojo uh, as a martial arts school in California. And I think it was, was it Tamapolis probably? Uh, certainly the Bay Area. And they were a big influence. Their books um, were kind of early books in this field and her leadership embodiment work. This is very clear. It's very good. She's one of the big names. Dylan Newcomb, perhaps slightly more second generation. He is someone I regard uh, as an absolute genius. You know, he's really smart guy. His Uzazu system is as deep as it gets. Of all the things I've researched, and I've, you know, I've traveled the world for 20 years trying to find the best people out there. His is one of the best of the sort of young guns. 
In terms of the other young guns, well, my, my, so my own group, which people like, uh, Anu Brack in the Netherlands, she's written a good book. There's Francis Breyers, I've worked with for many years in the UK, Alexander Vovoskaya in Moscow. We're a sort of next generation, as it were. And those guys, are, there's, there's other people out there doing work, but um, I don't want it to be too boastful. We've, we've done our homework and we've been doing this professionally for some time. I think my own company was the first uh, in bo- full-time, you know, embodied leadership and corporate sense company that existed in Europe, um, certainly in the UK. So, yeah, I'm big moment, blow my own trumpet a little bit there. Uh, and then we've got the trauma celebrity. So tr- the body has come back to therapy by trauma in quite a big way. Um, so you've got people like Pete Levine, Bette Rothschild, Bezel van der Kolk, uh, the guy who started TRE, his name I've forgotten. So there's various, these sort of big name, they're almost celebrities, you know, um, and they're working with the body, but particularly in a trauma context. Um, obviously, you've got the sort of yoga people, the sort of well-known yoga teachers in the modern world. Uh, there's a group who are operating a lot out of Scandinavia that are doing stuff with embodiment, explicitly my own embodied yoga principles, but not particularly that much. In the martial arts world, you've got Miles Kessler in Israel, we'll get him on. Um He's doing some very interesting stuff and putting different spiritual practices together with well, peace building out there. I'm sure I've missed loads of really good people out. And these are just um, uh, some of the people, you know, they're, oh, Stuart Heller, of course. So Stuart Heller is another one of uh, the kind of baby boomer generation that comes from martial arts and meditation background. He's a big name. Uh, we've got people coming out of the integral field. We'll get Rob McNamara on, hopefully, who was doing um, a kind of embodied weightlifting and things like that. So they're some of the people in the world today um, that I see as some of the, the bigger names. The other podcast I want to shout out to, I believe it's ending now, and this is almost in some ways this podcast is sort of taking on the baton, is Brooke Thomas's Liberated Body podcast. If you want, or it tends to be slightly more on the body than the embody, though it's evolved over the years to be embodied. I was a guest on it and really enjoyed her company. And for years I've enjoyed her podcast. So I really recommend, um, yeah, really recommend having a look at the Liberated Body podcasts. I think they're ending, if not now, then pretty soon, uh, but well worth a look. Okay, so my own personal story with this, I was a hyper-rational child. I was a, a, a head on a stick. IQ measured in the top 0.01%. Um, by various IQ tests, like maths tests and things that we'd done. Super clever. School was so easy for me. I ended up getting lots of trouble because it was just, you know, just way too easy. And I wasn't really interested in the body. There was sports at school. I played a bit of sports, you know, I played a bit of rugby just because I liked the aggression of it. Um, but really, you know, in my family, I come from a family of teachers and they sort of said, look, books are what matters, school is what matters. And I bought into that and was very good at that. However, by the age of uh, 14, I was suicidal. By the age of 16, I was alcoholic. By the age of 17, I'd totally failed in my first love relationship. I'd also failed my driving test three times, which is um, kind of a big deal when you live in the countryside and you rely upon your mum as a moody teenager. Yeah. So I'd, what I'd realised was, and here I was going, well, how come these kids that I thought were stupid at school, and oh, they're thick, you know, had passed their driving test when I hadn't. And I realised that, you know, it's kind of, oh, I hadn't been clever, but didn't realise this, that learning about something is not the same as learning to do something. I now call that, you know, skill acquisition. Um, so I'd realised quite late that uh, it wasn't just about learning about things. And this is what embodiment can be considered. It's about skill acquisition. It's also about being how you are. Yeah. The deeper levels of learning became apparent to me. Um, also the levels of learning, like the emotional level, the less self-regulation, the uh, relationships. I just, you know, emotional intelligence, which we could think of as a subset of embodied intelligence is another way of looking at embodiment, that embodiment involves awareness, regulation, social awareness and social influence, basic Daniel Goleman model of embodied intelligence. Um, the, there was a whole lot more to intelligence than cognitive intelligence. I would now say that integral model of Ken Wilber talks about lines of intelligence. I'd really hit in a very painful and ugly way that um, there was more than one way to be smart. And I did not have those other ways. Um, and I didn't know what to do. You know, I was distraught. I was like, oh my God. Um, I was literally suicidal and alcoholic as, as a fairly young teenager. And by the time I went to university to study psychology, I was disillusioned. I was disillusioned. Uh, uh, with 
cognitive learning with book learning because people always said look the real learning will start at the next step and I got to university and they still said all right now it starts your MA or your PhD I was like yeah I think I'm being sold a lie I'm tired of being jumping through hoops I'm tired of being told that book learning is what matters when I'm absolutely miserable and failing in the things that I now think are important um but I had a saving grace so I was at the time involved with various illegal activities I'm not sure how public I should be about these but uh these uh necessitated me how can I put it being able to defend my small business at the time I think you get the idea so I wanted to study a martial art actually I think there was a deeper yearning in there for uh, some sort of spirituality I'd rejected Christianity at this point my uh, mother had actually taken me to India at age 16 she got a a big check when she lost her job that she'd had for years and she said let's use it to go to India and Nepal so I went with my mother to India and Nepal I sort of wasn't quite ready for Buddhism though it's certainly you know I'm a Buddhist now but at the time it wasn't quite what I needed as a teenager, but it started to open the door. There was a bit more out there. I was reading books on Buddhism, which my mother let me have. My mother done yoga. She was a yoga teacher as well as a more formal teacher. So, you know, that door was a little bit open there. But I wasn't quite ready for it. So, But martial arts seemed much more appealing to an angry young man. And I remember walking into an Aikido school. I was at the university. It was my first week at university. And it was just beautiful the fluid movements the sense of power and grace integrated uh the sense of power without brutality the the formality the discipline of it and there's something just deep in me which said you need this yeah you need this and I, i hung to aikido like a drowning man to a raft you know it was like i'd been shipwrecked and this was the only raft in the sea to steal a analogy from terry dobson who's a famous aikidoka um And I almost didn't miss a class through three years of university. I became obsessed with it. I spent all my time at university doing Aikido and not really psychology. Um, But naturally, every psychology lecture I was in, I was thinking about it through through the lens of Aikido and the Japanese martial arts uh, more broadly, starting to broaden out into meditation and other things. Um, You know, I remember I had a turning point when I've told this story before, so excuse me if you've heard it before, but I was was in an exam and it was an exam on health psychology that had a bit on stress management. And uh, I was stressed because I hadn't done the work. And I thought, God, if I fail this, I'm going to get thrown out of university. You know, it was really like crunch point for me. It was kind of year two or something. And um, and I remembered, you know, Aikido centering, breathing techniques, you know, got myself together a little bit, able to scrape the pass in this exam. And afterwards, I thought, well, that's really funny, isn't it? You know, you can have um, this an exam about health psychology, but, you know, you could even if I knew all the work in the exam, it wouldn't have helped me be less stressed. Yeah. So um, learning about something, again, it's not the same as learning to do something that skills are what really matters and being what matters even more importantly than those. And I realized that Aikido was giving me a much richer education than I ever had in the areas that I was now interested in, you know, seeing how it was relevant to my life in so many ways. And the academic stuff I was studying just wasn't relevant in so many ways. So that was a big, a big uh, point for me. You know, after university, I, I had no intention of getting a kind of corporate office job. So what I ended up doing is spending several years um studying aikido full-time you know i just felt really cool to it so i lived in dojos and lived off nothing and odd jobs and did aikido full-time places like with um with william smith in birmingham uh, eventually in different places around the world another i was also working outdoor education with children so i'd be you know at the top of an abseil or climbing tower and again you know theory only goes so far when you're uh 50 feet up a tower and you're scared and you have to kind of talk someone to relax them right so it's not so much about words or theory i realized it was about embodiment again there working with kids working in my first sense of sort of corporate team building and leadership outside seeing kids really flourish in that outdoorsy kind of physical environment uh, if you've heard of outward bound or pgl that kind of thing um so that again was very visceral gave me another kind of education this outdoor education which i'd always kind of liked but working there for a few years really helped me doing the aikido obviously was a full of immersion into the body um so it wasn't just like a hobby you know it's something i did every single day it's like it was like an ma or something right phd actually more like so um i had that education a big turning point for me however was cyprus so um, my sister was decided to get married in cyprus she didn't want to get married at home cyprus is romantic isle of aphrodite british people sometimes get married there just for the sun she decided she wanted to get married there. And I said, okay, well, I'll get a job there. Because I was doing a lot of jobs on like beach resorts and ski resorts. I said, I'll get a job. I'll sort of check it out and I'll do a bit of research for you to help you out. And I uh, thought, you know, at least I can do. You know, I was traveling around a lot, so it wasn't that big a deal as much as it might sound. And I put a thing online and I said, um, I'm going to Cyprus. Does anyone know of an Aikido club? I do Aikido. It'd be nice to do some Aikido while I'm there. And I got an email back the next day from a guy called Don Levine. He was the founder of an organization called Aiki Extensions, 
Aikido Extensions is about bringing Aikido off the mat, this somatic psychology applied Aikido. I'd actually done my dissertation on that theme before Aikido Extensions was invented. So when I discovered Aikido Extensions, I was exalted. I was so happy because I basically reinvented the wheel doing Aikido and psychology and trying to cram the two together. And then I discovered there was people like Strozzi and Paul Linden and Wendy Palmer who were already working in this field, you know. And so Don said, look, we're actually doing this peace project with the United Nations involving Aikido in Cyprus. Um, if you find any Aikido, can you let us know? Because we're not sure if there is any on the island. Uh, we're just using it as a venue, but it'd be great to invite some local Aikido teachers. Anyway, I got more and more into that. I volunteered, ended up becoming the assistant manager. People, the organizers, people like uh, Don Levine and Strozzi were a bit busy. And so I ended up just putting the hours in and doing the dog's body work, running around the island and making contact. And it was quite exciting. It was a bit sort of James Bond-esque, you know, being smuggled across borders and um, uh, finding the secret Aikido club. And, you know, it was fun. And I got more involved in this organization, like extensions. And it was a life-turning event when I saw the... Aikido, or more broadly embodiment, people like Paul Linden were there, Jesse Bueno from Brazil, the Ethiopians I met, um, Miles Kessler I talked about, were using uh, Aikido and embodiment for peace building, for a kind of noble, bigger purpose. And they were also using it with trauma work, with business leadership. Um, and I was like, wow, this is what I want to do. So I spent the next three years interning in uh, Aikido Extensions at the University of Chicago with Don. He was a great mentor for me. He's deceased not that long ago. Rest in peace, Don. Absolute genius. And, um, you know, living with him, we'd have work 12 hours, they'd have meetings while I was in the bath. I mean, you know, I was doing Aikido every day. It's a very intimate relationship, actually. And um, with Don, I, I learned, you know, this wider field. He was a great man educating me. He was the dean of the University of Chicago at one point. He was actually Barack Obama's boss at one point. Um, had lots of connections at high level government. He was really playing a big game, you know, in Ethiopian politics and American politics. Um, he was known as a published professor, blah, blah, blah. And he inspired me that something bigger could be done with this, as did Strozzi, you know, staying on his ranch, seeing the stuff he was doing with the military or with leadership. We had disagreements about politics and things, but it was certainly, you know, someone that was playing a big game. Uh, Jamie Zimron, there was all kinds of people that I was being introduced to who really inspired me. And I eventually up stayed at a lot of their dojos and learned, you know, like Paul Linden, I went and lived with him, you know. Uh, that's just what I did. I was an apprentice. I interned in the old way. I carried their bags and asked them annoying questions and got thrown around by them in Aikido every day. And I learned the hard way. And they were also, Aikido Extensions was also deploying me in areas of conflict in difficult locations, you know, in Ethiopia, for example, in the slums of Brazil. I saw, saw a lot of violence, unfortunately, there as well as a lot of beauty. Um and eventually I sort of got a bit burnt out from living out of a bag and being around violence and um, not having any stability or income or whatever it was, all these, you know, things that most people take for granted. Um, and, I, you know, I had a tapeworm, I had a car accident, my drinking had got worse and I, I was alcoholic again. Um, my mother had a tumour and, you know, I hit a kind of rock bottom of just being a sort of wretch in a wretched place, washed up in rural East Anglia in a crappy village I didn't like, trying to look after my mum, but really just drinking every day. And I really hit a low point. And I thought, well, you know, it's either suicide or, or do something here. You know, it's either I, I kill myself. And it was really serious. You know, I was really you know, Googling the best ways to do that. Um, it's either suicide, slow suicide for alcoholism, um, or I turn my life around. And for some reason, I, I, I turned my life around. I made that choice. I had a car accident that almost killed me. It was a bit of a wake-up call, a bit of a bash to the head, quite literally. Um, and I said, you know what, I want to do something with my life. So I got sober. I went out for one final board meeting to California to Ike Extensions, kind of reported in for all these crazy projects and uh, slightly, you know, out there dodgy things that I'd been doing with Ike Extensions around the world and said, right, it's been great, guys, but thank you. It's time to leave and um, start my own business. And that was about 10 years ago. And since then, I have been... Uh, Working in every conceivable business, you know, I've had clients you've heard of like Axia and Unilever and L'Oreal and I'm going to work with Ikea fairly soon and I've worked with Shell, I've worked in the House of Lords, I've worked with every major NGO, I've done a lot of stuff for NGOs. Oxfam, Save the Children, etc., etc. A lot of the big boys uh, worked in government. I was talking to the NHS yesterday about some healthcare work, leadership, stress management, team building, communication, all these kind of things. I learned to make a business out of it, and I learned to use the internet for that. And you know, at first, I had no idea how to run a business because I wasn't a businessman, and no was anyone in my family. Um, but I, this, you know, I learned from some people. I had some good mentoring. And I started a business doing this stuff. And it's now, you know, relatively successful. We teach something called the Embodied Facilitator course around the world, particularly in Moscow and London. Um, so I've trained a lot of other trainers and coaches now. 
Um, what else? I started Embodied Yoga Principles a few years back as a way of bringing embodiment to yoga because I could see that as the great hope for the modern world in terms of embodiment. I'm working with coaching. I got married last year. I was working with therapists uh, in the Ukraine in the war there. I had a beautiful interpreter. So it's amazing where this life brings you. You know, I've continued learning in that time, taking courses and everything I can. I deliberately moved back to Brighton to live because there was so much you could do here. It was so nice to, you know, like yesterday I talked to, um, what did I do yesterday? I had an Alexander Technique lesson. Then I talked to Laurie Booth, who's a famous dancer here. Uh, then I went to Pete Blackaby's world-class yoga teachers to his class. Um, you know, in the evening I did a Feldenkrais thing on my phone, which I was able to download. Then I made a couple of YouTube videos and went on Facebook and promoted a Paul Linden video. I mean, the possibilities in the modern world are fantastic. You know, I feel like I'm totally, um, blagging it would be the English phrase, uh, to be, you know, to be making a living doing what I love. I've, I've traveled to, I don't know, 25, 30 countries. I'm in about 20 countries a year, actually traveling. I'm in Romania fairly soon. I've worked a lot in Eastern Europe, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, and as I said, some dodgy places too, like Afghanistan, um, Sierra Leone. Um, so it's been fascinating the last 10 years. And for me, this podcast is a way of, of, of reaching out to the wider embodiment community, of saying, okay, guys, we're all out there, we're all doing our thing. Let's see if this, we can make a central place to get together. And what I'm hoping with the podcast is to spread kind of good word of, of um, you know, things that I know, but I'm going to get at least 50% of the podcast will be guests from other people. Um, many of the people I've mentioned already, I'll be getting on as guests, uh, whether they like it or not, and we'll be getting people on. And, um, yeah, hearing different perspectives on embodiment because so many exist, making this freely available to people. That's something, you know, I've my YouTube channel's about 11 million hits. Uh, look up the embodiment channel. And I've really enjoyed that on YouTube, but I've realized YouTube's not for everyone. You know, what I like about podcasts is um, you can listen to it while walking down the street or on the way to work. You know, you can listen to a bit here, a bit there. You don't have to see the, see the screen to do it. And it just seems very accessible as a medium. I'm also hoping we'll build an online community over this, so there'll be a Facebook group that you can find if you Google the Embody the Embody Podcast. Uh, the, you you will you will get that. So the Embodiment Podcast. Sorry. So whew, that was over an hour. Uh, my intention for these podcasts when I'm interviewing people is to go probably for about an hour and twenty minutes. Probably be a bit less for the ones where I'm just talking. <laughs> Maybe up to two hours for the ones where I've got guests on. Um, I'm open to your. Uh, in, in the, you know, if you want to suggest someone, please don't suggest yourself, but if you want to suggest someone that's senior in this world and that has interest or innovative, senior and innovative, they're the two things I'm really kind of looking for um, in people. So, whew, bit of a down like that, wasn't it? Quite a lot there. So I hope that was useful to you. Um, I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities of this podcast and um, what what it can bring. What, it, what I can bring to you with this, what we can bring to each other. Um, so yeah, Mark Walsh here signing out. Um, it's been good.